Okay, we are recording. Lewis, how are you today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm a little tired. I've got um, I've got two little ones under the age of three. I've got oh, four man. month old and a two and a half old, and we're doing a house renovation at the moment. Oh yeah, don't take too much on. <laughs> I am. Um, and what's really annoying as well is that my wife is handling it really, really well. Right. Uh, and I'm Just, not. Right. So, so I can't be, when I'm being stroppy and she's lovely and she's making cups of tea for builders and she's surviving on like three or four hours sleep and I'm like just a bit mardy, um, I've, I've got to quickly snap myself out of it. <laughs> um, to bar all that, I'm great. I'm great. Good. Shining. I'm happy. Lovely. Lovely. Where are you today? Uh, so we live in Margate now. Nice. Like, um, yeah. So like every... Um, you know, hipster, flat white, avocado eating East Londoner. <laughs> <laughs> Over the last 10 years, we've all gone far too expensive here. And uh, it seems like loads of people have moved out to Margate. So I'm one to follow the trend. How are you finding it? Because like so many people that I've had on this podcast are, are, have, have now sort of relocated down. And I've been down a few times uh, to, to interview people in Margate. And, and one of the co-hosts of my other podcast has, has literally recently moved there. And it's really weird. It's like for, for me growing up like an hour away from Margate, like the the, the Dreamland Park or whatever, what was he called? Dreamland? Yeah, was yeah, it? Dreamland. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. that was called Ben Bon Brothers when I was a kid. And it was like okay. it was like the holy grail. You know, if you got to go there when you was like ten, that was like it was everything. And then I went back there when I was about twenty and it was just borderline derelict and it was like heartbreaking. <laughs> and like and now you're seeing like the gorillas playing live there and stuff like that. It looks like amazing. And 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 just like I like to have a little bit of a, a, a an outdoor wild swim. And they've got the little pool thing, haven't they, down in, in Margate where you can have a little uh, little swim oh. in the sea. It looks lush. Yeah, it, it's it's brilliant. The winters are long, but the summer is wicked. Like summer, like the sea is is just even though it's the North Sea, it's so clear, crystal clear. It's tropical at times, so we're we're very lucky. But um, we've just about got the right uh, balance now because we've obviously yeah. we've moved away from friends and family. Did that just before the lockdown twenty twenty. Right. Um, so we were like, this is gonna be amazing. Some like you talk, there's like places like Dreamland and things like and the coast is just living by the coast is amazing. We were locked <laughs> down. Um, we were locked down and locked away from everyone. Um, so that hit is quite hard, but now we've realized to make this place work, um, every weekend as a family, we have to be either going to see friends in London or going to see relatives because then it makes it worthwhile. Yeah. Otherwise we feel a bit lonely and we get the itch, uh, of London again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, whereas now if we get our little social kick at the weekend, we're yeah. far too knackered to do anything else. Yeah. 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 That, that it's fine you know so we've, we've started to find the right balance now uh but yeah like you say it's it totally rejuvenated this place now to what it, even like to what it was two and a half years ago yeah um how, how cool. did you find lockdown as 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 an artist like not you know because like, like so many people in the creative sort of fields whether it be music comedy acting whatever everything stopped and yeah like, you know how, how did you sort of deal with that did you have work throughout lockdown? Did you sort of manage to be one of the lucky ones that, that found bits and pieces? Um, yeah, I think in my industry, uh, it created a bit of a bottleneck situation. So it happened. Everyone was scared beyond belief. So quite uh, relieved that it did stop because I was filming Unforgotten season four. Mm -hmm. We were about to do a big funeral scene in a church with like 300 people. Uh, and I remember really freaking out about that and then being really relieved when the producers called and said, look, we've had to stop. It's, it's getting out of hand now. Um, and then there was sort of three months where it was touch and go. Like, what well, I don't know what what we're going to do. I, I ended up, um, I got, do you know, so Manston Airport around here was used as like the Brexit car park. It's where all the lorry drivers got sent. Right. So I got a gig there, um, handing out COVID tests, testing all like these Bulgarian and Polish and all these drivers from all over Europe who were furious with us. And then yeah. sometimes like Dover would get shot and we'd all have to run into this little cabin as sort of everyone had kick off. So for the first three months, it was like really scary. No one knew what was going to happen. Yeah. 
and then productions found a way of sort of managing everything and we managed to gear back up and I think it's sort of been the busiest it's ever been for me because I think so many things are getting made and they're not able to get say who they want and they're like oh Lewis Reeves will do we'll get him in (laughs) (laughs) so he'll do it whatever so it's it's, so in that respect it's been um it's, it's been it's been quite nice now we've sort of found our our way around it yeah but yeah, at first it was, uh, it was very scary. Okay. Right, I'm going to start your playlist, mate. Um, for okay. track one, Lewis, I want you to tell me the song that you regard as having the greatest ever intro, please. For me, Midnight Train to Georgia, Gladys Knight and the Pips. Oh, it's a beauty, isn't it? It's just a classic. And I don't, risk of sounding cliche, they just don't make them like that anymore. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's iconic. Gladys Knight and the pit, they just take you, it's just such a slow build. It takes you, it's real storytelling in song format. Um, and it's cool. It's really cool. It starts like almost like a knocking, mm. it sort of like brings you in. Uh, and I always wanted to be a pip. <laughs> but I just thought they were the coolest things yeah. ever. All matching shoots, like dance routines, slick harmonies. Um, I'm nothing like a Pip, yeah. nor Gladys Knight, unfortunately. But gr- growing up, like, I grew up on, my mum was, uh, she was big into Northern Soul and Motown and stuff like that. So that's one that I, I really remember. And that I can still, I, even though I've listened to it about a thousand times, yeah. I can still listen to it now and it's it's pleasant and it's beautiful and you go on a journey or you, and you hear something new. It's so layered. Yeah. And you hear something new every time. I, I love it. I mean, you've mentioned London and Margate, but the accent doesn't sound like you grew up there. Where where, where was home growing up? Uh, Doncaster, all with a very different place. Um, yeah, I, I lived there till I was about 12. And then my mum and my stepdad, they were in the pub industry. So we used to move around the country constantly. Um, sometimes I live with nightclubs, so I used to hang out with all the DJs and sometimes they'd have stuff. Uh, where they had bands on and stuff. So music was always really influential and around us. I was always sort of around yeah. artists. Um, uh, and I can remember my mum talking to us about going up to like Warrington and all the club nights and putting talcum powder on the floor and dancing at Northern Soul. And for me, that was just like the epitome of cool. Oh, it you know, really is. Music. Yeah. And there's sort of like a renaissance. There's sort of like, it's sort of coming back around here, actually. Like you see the young, young lads... Uh, on Lambrettas and like the three-piece coats in this weather as well. Yeah, it's it's mental. It's it's so amazing and it, it's it's it makes no sense Northern Soul as well when you look at it and you just think right what what is this scene built on and it's like well kind of not Motown but the songs that weren't hits like yeah. we we can do this deep dive and find these like obscure records yeah. and create this phenomenal scene where I think like. Look, I think the Wigan Casino was like voted the coolest club in the world or something, like, you know, in, in the in the tail end of the seventies. And now when you think like How? Wigan Casino. <laughs> like <laughs> just them two yeah. words. Like, you know, yeah. nothing against Wigan. But yeah. like, you know, Studio fifty four would have been open then. It's like yeah. and it's just incredible that this this amazing scene that created this this I, I mean I I'm I'm no expert on it, but but, but, you know, just through being fascinated by that scene and, and realising that that dance scene come from, at the time, lads trying to mimic Bruce Lee uh, yeah. and, and the dancing. And, and it just, like, I would give anything. I've been to quite a few Northern Soul dudes and I would love to be able to to hold my own on that dance floor. Like, yeah, it's, exactly. uh, oh, it's, it's something to behold. It really is. And, and it's just, and that music, it's when you hear Northern Soul, it's like, you, it's just music that's made to make you want to dance. It's like straight away, it's like, oh, my foot's going, I've got to dance. Got to it's dance. cool. It's slick. It's one of the things that I'm sort of envious. So I'm 34. Uh, and one thing that I can see going back to sort of like the 40s, every decade had a movement. And with that movement, you had fashion and there was like an, uh, an evolution in music. And then I was born 88. So I had like Britpop 90s. 
some really great bands coming through that. And then when you got to sort of the noughties, it's like those same things weren't happening again. It, was, it, it sort of got, it, it had its heyday, that sort of 50, 60 years where you had something brand spanking new every decade. Um, I don't know if that's, we, what we did get then was the internet. I don't know if that has Maybe. stopped something, but it's something that I love to talk about. And I talk about it, you know, quite a lot on here that you're, you're so right. That tribalism in music sort of yeah. disappeared. And, you know, I've, I, I've run a, a, a club for 30 years and, you know, you see different, different sorts of movements come through these clubs and and you know and and that is like it goes beyond the music as you say it's the fashion and and you, you could go oh well someone walks through the club and you like the door of the club is like i can tell that they're into that yeah and like and now you can't like yeah. apart from metal metalers are metalers they'll always be metalers like yeah, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, 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 they're they're never going to change but everything else is kind of blurred into this kind of top shop window of everybody kind of looks the same and everybody listens to a bit of this and a bit of that and yeah. and it's not a bad thing that you know people are listening to a bit of everything now rather than well no I'm an indie kid or or no I'll listen to garage or whatever I, I but yeah I do think them them tribes in music and their movements like I think they're really exciting and and you know nothing you have, to, you have to look for it a lot more now that it's still yeah. out there and there's still those people like yeah. you know you walk down the high street you're like well, that lad's dressed like a teddy boy or yeah. whatever. And you, but you can still find it, but yeah, it's not as accessible. It might have something to do because of the internet. Yeah. It's something beautiful about having something tangible, like going to a record shop yeah. and buying that one album. And then yeah. you sit through that one album and you listen to it and it's an experience and you put yourself in the shoes of the artist. Uh, whereas now I could just put it this on shuffle and it would discover new music for me. Like, like I, I, I listen to music every day, but... I, I have no idea who I'm listening to half the time because yeah. it's just so it's so saturated with so much, and in that it actually becomes slightly negative because you stop investing in artists because it's, it's so easy to get. It's good and bad, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. brilliant that you can have everything that you ever want to hear, but do you get to the, the one thing I think that is lost is the fact that people now just go and cherry pick tracks and not mm. listen to an album as a body of work. And, yeah. I, and I think so many albums, them artists spend so long trying to piece that running order together that, you know, that it sounds, you know, a, like a complete piece of art. And yeah. and I think that's lost a little bit, but I'm 49, so I'm going to think that. Do you know what I mean? And I, and I think like, you know, as you said, there are there are probably still the, these movements in music and these purists that, that are, you know, they're probably like, 18 listening to this now just kind of shut up granddad what are you talking about yeah, like, there's loads of it you, you yeah, don't need to know about it you're 49 <laughs> yeah. but uh but yeah all right well look, i'm gonna take you back um for track two uh and ask you please to tell me the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you please i mean this is just embarrassing really it's such a cliche mm -hmm. but uh robbie williams angels okay would probably be the one <laughs> for me um uh because that was probably 97 98 that came out so i'd have been about 10 i can remember it being a list a lot of, like <laughs> my mum would have like celine dion on and gloria estefan and we'd listen to like the beautiful south we listened to simply red and lighthouse family and that those all had beautiful warm connotations of that sort of time but i can remember angels is like a young lad being like i can remember taking himself to my room putting the tape on and really like really getting him thinking about sad things <laughs> and really getting into it and singing along and being like yeah this is profound what is happening these emotions to me right now uh and now looking back i think oh my god what a pillar <laughs> um also i've done 400 episodes of this podcast first First time I've ever heard the word pillock and shout out pillock. What a word. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so <right>. underrated. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it's, it's, it's just a beautiful song. Lyrically as well, I think Robbie Williams' sister, she's a poet and she wrote a lot in that. And there's, there's just a lot to get from it. But that was that was the first one 
as a, as a kid that had uh, that it moved me. So I think yeah. emotionally, uh, probably did for a lot of people. Um, but I'm a, I'm a massive Robbie Williams fan as well. I thought I was a massive Robbie Williams fan, and then I met one of my best mates at drama school, um, and we were having an argument. I was like, "Well, I was there at Nebworth uh, Escapology." I was like, I've been there, mate. And then he dropped his trousers uh, at, at the bar uh, and revealed he's got I love Robbie Williams tattooed on his ass. That's a statement. And I went, yeah, you win. Fair play. Congratulations. Pine? Yeah. <laughs> be my, best, my best mate forever. <laughs> but he's from Pontypridd. They just sort of do things like that. He's got mate, mate, he's tattooed on his foot as well. So it's like, I think he's actually a big fan. He just thought it'd be funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's such a, a big song. And I, I literally saw some footage of him singing it at, at Soccer Aid or something at the weekend. And, and you know, it's, it's in the very fabric of British culture now, that song, isn't it? Yeah. You, you know, and, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is the fact that it's a brilliant, brilliant record. And, yeah. and I'm, I remember seeing, like, I was never a, a, a Take That fan. And, and when he quit and... I remember watching Glastonbury, uh, probably about 96, 97, and he'd quit take that and he'd come out and uh, and, he, and he literally, I think that was the week that he'd been hanging out with Robbie. No, it wasn't that one he'd been hanging out with Liam. It was the year after. And he'd, he'd had a few sort of minor hits and he'd come out and he... That's it, yeah. And he absolutely bossed it with Angels. And, like, and now when you think, yeah, you've gone from being disposable sort of boy band pop star to yeah. like you, you you've gone into like the different realm now you, you you've become yeah. like everybody loves you and yeah. and you know he's I don't think he's the greatest singer on the planet but I think he's an incredible entertainer like yeah. you know yeah. you, you, you whenever you see him live it's like you're getting energy you're getting you're getting something special and, oh, uh, Incredible. one of the best gigs of my life in terms of having fun yeah. A real showstopper was uh, the Escapology album at Nebworth. They yeah. came out hanging upside down. That was just... I was also 15 and I drank about 16,000 Smyrna Fices that night. So that, probably do might, that might do it as well. It was the best <laughs> night of my life. I think it was the first time some middle-aged bloke gave me a spliff as well. So I was like, this is the best. <laughs> I, was a, I was in the place where I think I might die. Yeah, uh, and have an anxiety attack, and also this is absolutely euphoric and the best thing that I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and that might have had a uh, a slight effect on it, but yeah, I've just yeah always loved him, and that that was like the first one that I can sort of remember being like, whoa, okay, yeah. wow, this is this is this is pretty cool. different different level. Lovely. All right, let's stay in the formative years. Um, I'm going to ask you for track three, um, please, to tell me the song that reminds you of your time at school. This is tough. This is really tough. Okay. Um, but I've gone sort of for the earliest, uh, earliest that I sort of can remember. I mean, this is embarrassing. Oh, God. Okay, so I'm going to go for Maria Maria, which was Carlos Santos. Um, and it was the one, you know, the, I uh, San, oh, no, Santana, who, yeah. you know, the guitarist. Yeah. The, um, Mexican guitarist and uh when he did um the R and B track Marie Maria and uh I, I literally thought I was gonna be like Boys to Men or Jagged Edge. Uh I remember going to school discos thinking I looked the absolute nuts and I had uh, a bright white do rag on. A oh, what? Your do rag, you know what what black people would wear to keep their weave tight? Right. So I'd like that because I thought I was an absolute geezer and I'd wear a bright white string vest with a massive chain. Bearing in mind, I'm like 13 years old, a white lad in Buckinghamshire at this point in my life, rocking up, doing all this popping and locking and literally thought I was the bee's knees. And that was literally what was, I think we had me and my mate, Jamie Collings, Oliver Hayward. We rehearsed like a dance routine when this would come on. Oh, do you know what I was about to say? What the Fucking hell, was Jamie Collins not thinking, I need to have a word here. Look at what Lewis is wearing. But no, he's involved in a dance routine with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's it, that's it. <laughs> um, and that that was a big, that was a big, big track. 
for us at that time. I can also remember that was like the birth, birth of Garage around that time as well. I remember listening to So Solid Crew, Oh No, and 21 Seconds, and just thinking I was the bee's knees and I was going to be the next big R&B forward slash MC. And then I think I went to like an under 18s night when I was 13, 14, and my MC, MC name was MC Little Lou. And uh, I thought, yeah, this is going to be the night. I've been writing verses for a, for a couple of months and uh, thought, thought this is going to be the night. Uh, and then went to, uh, <laughs> to, to enter the place. And uh, I was with my girlfriend at the time and sort of got involved in an altercation where some other lad headbutted me. He took my date in for the evening and I ran off home and cried to my mum all night. <laughs> so then I gave up uh, MCing. It weren't for you, mate, I don't think. It wasn't for me. I was trying to be something I wasn't. It just didn't work out. Mm. And I look back now and I think, what was I, what on earth, what did I see? What What was going through my head? I generally think, like, if you're, like, sort of 14, 15 and you're wearing a, a, a white string vest and, uh, and, and a big chain, I think... You need friends around you to just go, mate, do you know what you look like? But if you've got friends that are on board with it, you know, that are actually doing dance routines, that's where you've gone wrong. I mean, my I'm not mate, a life coach, but I'm, I'm just suggesting that could be it. This is my mate. My mate, Jamie Collins, went, look, we've got 20 quid. Let's not go to F Heinz and get some cheap shit jewellery. Let's go to the hardware store and we'll get some cheap chains Oh, come on instead that you that you'd use for like the bloody plug in the bath <laughs> we'd spend a couple of quid on that we'd do that think we look the absolute nuts rock into the place <laughs> horrendous horrendous oh to, mate yeah i think we used to highlight and straighten our hair as well we had big diamond tape earrings i literally thought i thought i was usher Jesus Christ. Yeah. You did not look like Usher, trust me. Like, no, I mean, I'm, I'm picturing what you've described there. I'm not seeing Usher. No, mate. Just some scrawny little lantern <laughs> with far too much attitude. <laughs> Ridiculous. I, I, we need to edit everything out there. <laughs> what was brilliant was when you said this one could be embarrassing, I thought it was going to be the song, not the outfit and just the general personality of yourself was, at that point. It's a great song, Maria Maria, great song. Great. Everything around that time <laughs> I was doing with that music was so wrong on so many levels. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. What an answer. Um, aside from um, outfits, uh how, how was school? I mean, oh, you, you mentioned that uh, your parents were in the sort of uh, the, the, the pub game and, and clubs and yeah. stuff. Like, so moving around and that, like, how, how did that impact on school? Um, yeah, I mean, it was quite. It was quite. Uh, my my parents were always quite good at um, making everything at home nice and steady. So even though we were jumping about because my parents would sort of like renovate a place or do a place up or go look after a pub for quite for quite some time, um, home life was always pretty steady and we made mates pretty quick. And the big jump was going from Doncaster to Marlow when I was about 12 years old. Yeah. But in all honesty, we lived in quite a rough area and going from Doncaster, Balby Doncaster, which was quite a poor, deprived, ex sort of mining town, my my real daddy worked in the factory my granddad was formerly that factory and then we moved to marlow um where they had regattas and there was boat races on the thames and stuff it was like we were like this is an absolute touch so we did it didn't really phase us at all we would sort of just jumped at the opportunities that had sort of sort of landed on our feet we were very sort of grateful to to my parents to be able to give us that sort of lifestyle really actually so, so school was school was all right. I was a bit of a hustler at school. Um, me and my mates. So we started. I thought I was going to be an MC, and then I started. I really got into DJing when I was about twelve, thirteen, and I used to come down and I, my parents would let me do ten minutes set, like half ten or whatever. And it was a bit of a novelty. Uh, and then that grew and grew and grew. Um, 
probably early, way into my early 20s, but through school, we would, um, what we'd do is we'd hire out a village hall, some little village hall somewhere where the little old ladies rang and they'd, they'd serve all our mates who were like 14, 15. We used to call them Funkadelic Fridays. We'd make about 500 tickets, hand cut them out, these little turntables, Funkadelic Friday, we thought it was amazing. We'd hand cut them out, sell them for three quid a pop, get everyone in and then we take a little cut off the bar as well we used to make an absolute fortune all the way up yeah it was wicked all the way up until the age of um 18 and then we because we would thought we thought the absolute nuts and then everyone was able to actually go to bars yeah we tried to do one funkadelic friday after everyone had sort of turned 18 and about you know my mum and five friends turned up <laughs> and we were like maybe we've had that heyday that's it now oh mate i mean i'm like i mean i've been a promoter all my life i mean you was having it off at that age that's ridiculous mate we used to we used to like take 800 quid a night each yeah <laughs> it, it was unreal and it started getting like people from so then sort of like people down from high wickham we used to get people coming from bracknell uh, West London was coming out. It started getting a bit fruity, so I had to ask my mum's door staff if they'd come do a shift. <laughs> <It's> this little <laughs> like Marlow Bottom Village Hall. <laughs> the the women who used to service they did no, not know what hit them. People were doing drugs in the toilets. It's absolute chaos. It's Lovely. absolute chaos. It was, brilliant. it was brilliant. I think I'd still be a virgin now if I hadn't done that. <laughs> It was the only way that we sort of got to, to talk to girls. We used to be like, yeah, we'll, we'll get you a free ticket for Funkadelic Friday. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. So sort of doing that at such a young age, what what did you want to be when you was at school? Did you have any, was it something in that kind of creative sort of field? Um, I, I guess so. I sort of just sort of fell, it, fell into it all. I think everything, so I've got two young brothers, so three boys. And it was mainly just the boys uh, and my mum, really. Um, and uh, everything was around making mum laugh, like performing for her and doing that. Uh, and she used to, anything creative we do, she'd try and give as much attention and encouragement towards. So whether that be DJing or playing the drums or whatever, we were always very active, not very academic, Certainly, I wasn't. So she just sort of pushed us into that. And the, I think that entertainment feel came from, you know, DJing. I started to get a bit of a buzz and really enjoyed emceeing that sort of instant crowd feedback. Um, and then I took up sort of dance as well at the sort of same time. I was sort of doing hip hop and street. And then my school, I was sort of wasn't doing very well. And they were like, well, why don't you try and put that into qualification and take up dance for your teams and then I got a bit more of that performance aspect through that so I think I had DJing and dancing I really enjoyed that and then that sort of blended into to acting where I was like forced to basically go in school plays and it was the best thing for me I think for me they were like just okay let's try and refine refine this energy yeah. um and then I really found something in that took a year out after school to save up and audition for drama schools and stuff like that. Um, and then haven't looked back really. And then that's sort of been me for the last 15, 16 years. That's sort of my process and sort of how I found it. But I, I definitely think music and DJing was the birth of all that. I can remember DJing at the millennium. Uh, and I was really, at first I was really into my hard house and trance and playing William Orbit. Uh, I, as... I literally interviewed him last week on here. You're joking. <laughs> literally last week. You are joking. Me. <laughs> oh my God. We had at that time, he had that, um, the string, the Baggio strings yeah. out in the trance remix. And that was a really new sound for me. And I can remember playing that as uh, the new year was coming in and everyone absolutely going off. There's about 500 people. I'm 12 years old in this gazebo in this pub garden. Um, I didn't realise everyone was probably just coming up at the time. But, <laughs> yeah. And everyone's coming up to me like, oh my God, there's this kid here, it's amazing. So I think that instant, whoa, like people loving what you're doing and what you're playing and that response was, was um, it's addictive. 
Yeah. And and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to follow this. Yeah. And I think I was all right as a DJ. Yeah. My mate, Togger, um, we were called DJ Low, it was Lewis and Ollie. Um, uh, he was a much better DJ uh, than me. I sort of, I was a bit more of the businessman. Yeah. Um, but I just, I love that feeling and that vibe. And I think that's what sort of put me on the tracks to where I am now, maybe. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Track four. The first thing I remember buying from a record shop. Um, two versions of this story. Okay. So I used to, used to get five pounds every week. I'd go to Capital Records and I'd buy a record. So I was really into trance and uh, hard house at the time. And I think maybe my first one was uh, DJ John, the launch. Yeah. Do you remember that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. the, um, as I just thought that was that was quite light because that was quite commercial to what I was actually probably yeah. really playing in the pub. Um, but that's the first one that I can remember my parents giving me five quid and because all the DJs who worked in my mum's pub, they'd give me a record here or there, oh, go listen yeah. to this and go do that. Uh, and I think someone had some old sort of Gemini deck and they sort of gave us that and I was, you know, I was just buzzing with that. But that was the first one that I remember going and it was bright red um I had this bright red sleeve and I remember being quite a big tune at the time and I just remember playing that over sometimes it's like an alarm going off du, 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 du. um I can still hear that now um so that was the first record that I bought but I can also remember very vividly um getting my mum to go to Capitol Records because I was too embarrassed because I had a rep by this time <laughs> <laughs> I thought I did. Uh, and that's the first time someone said rep as well as pillock on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Loving it. <laughs> uh, that's because I am a pillock with no rep. <laughs> I, can, I can remember sending her to the shop to buy me Will Young Evergreen. Yeah. And she bought it on 12 inch record as well. And it went in my bag. I can even remember, I just loved that. I played it over and over again. That that and Robbie Williams. Um, and I think I can remember one night being with, you know, the lad was probably 19, 18, and he, he let me do 10 minutes. And then he was going through my record bag, and then he pulled out Will Young, and he just sort of looked at me, evergreen. Crushed. Like that. I just went, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I put it back and then carried on DJ and remember being so, so embarrassed. Um, I, I think he's got a fucking beautiful voice, Will Young. Will Young is an, ama is an amazing artist and he's amazing because he stood the test of time. He's gone yeah. from Cowell's record label, that whole thing when it was mm. pop idol or pop stars or what, whatever it was. And he's got a real authentic soul and... Mm jazz-like quality to, to, to some of his work and he stood the test of, test of time absolutely you know, 20 years and he's made amazing amazing music i think really soulful and lush but when you're 12 years old yeah mate yeah you're right you can't, you can't be admitting that uh definitely not definitely not <laughs> i always like to ask guests uh certainly sort of you know sort of actors and and, and and such about confidence when, when they were growing up um I presume he was quite a confident young man from from the outfits and uh, and, and and hustles. Uh, start of life was quite tough, so I was um, a really really nervous kid. Used to have a stammer, um, not very confident with my reading uh, and things like that. Really dyslexic, and um, for whatever reason, life was quite hard for me and my mum in Doncaster. So she spent, and that, it was that way till I was probably about nine, ten years old. Uh, so then she spent the best part of the, the next decade doing everything she could to build me up. And the way that she did that is she took, chucked me and my brothers into Taekwondo, learn a martial art, uh, have to do exams and take a bit of pride in myself. Um, so I think she put so much effort into like getting us to do martial arts, supporting me with my DJing. Um, that then I became slightly overconfident way up into my sort of like late teens, early twenties, and then sort of had to rein it back 
um, again. But at the start of life, I was, I was really I'm quite nervous kid. My mum used to say that you don't have to talk to anyone, but it's, you know, it's polite to say hello and goodbye and please for things, but you don't have to say anything else. Um, then she couldn't get me to shut up. Changing schools and such, do you think that gave you a, a, a sort of a, a skill set to be able to, you know, to have to talk to people, to, to, to kind of, you know, get stuck in, otherwise, you know, you, you can get left behind. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, yeah, no, I know, I, I, I do. It also, it was quite tough as well, because I, with schools and stuff, I, I sort of felt like, have you seen The Departed? Mm. In that, there's a line where um, they're talking about Leonardo DiCaprio and they go, I bet you were two people. You were one person there and you were one person there. Um, and it was kind of like that. I was from like this working class, tough world up in Bowlby, Doncaster, a place that I love. Um, and then I also lived in Marlow as well, this really affluent area, uh, really privileged to grow up in but neither communities accepted me as I, w- I wasn't a northerner nor was I a southerner. So I used to get sort of, you know, sort of uh, the mick taken out for both, but I didn't really know where home was. So it was quite unsettling and it took me a while to sort of just feel like, well, I am where I am and I, 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 yeah. I am who I am sort of thing. Sort of felt like a bit of a, sort of a, a gypsy sort of like roaming I didn't yeah. there wasn't a place that was home and I think with that comes sort of uncertainty of who you are and what you're doing and where you're going and if anything's ever gonna stay the same sort of thing I think that yeah. took quite a while to get used to and as a kid especially going through puberty and all those sort of things that can be quite unsettling and that took quite a while for me to get to get used to looking back I don't think I realized that at the time but now yeah, I think there's certainly a lot of truth to that. That was that was quite tough. Okay. Tell me the song that soundtrack your years clubbing, please. So when I was hitting the club scene, club music for me was shit. Okay. That, which 16 to 18, because it was so commercial. Um, uh, and I just remember thinking that, like going like it was just the same, you know what I mean? vodka rev type style regurgitated poppy you'd have a bit of a synth sound with like influences from trance and hard house uh and then there'd be like a a chorus break and then some rapper would do something on it and then and then it'd lead into something else it all felt this the same old thing was getting regurgitated um which led me down a different path with my sort of DJ and then r- running those nights I sort of felt like a responsibility to show people um good club music growing up in pubs and clubs and stuff and at that time one thing that I was uh just I fell in love with was like gospel house Now I'm not a religious person at all but gospel house like people like Jasper Street were just wicked and I was really into I was going to loads of festivals DJing uh, like funky soul festivals where you'd have like live singers and like these gospel singers would sing on tracks and people would just lose their minds. Um, and my my stepdad was, um, it just feels good. It's upbeat, it's got a fast beat, BPM, and the, these vocals are just infectious. Um, and there was one track I would play, uh, it's called He's All Right, Jasper Street. And it would start with this like organ and like people clapping. And you could see people at the bar being like, what the fuck is this kid playing? And what on earth? And then it'd build and build for about a minute and a half. And then it'd kick off with this preacher and he'd go, right, now it's time to take you back to some of that old school hand clapping, foot stomping. And then the beat would come in and everyone would just, it would be, it was like probably being like a gospel church on a Sunday. Yeah. But it's a load of piss people in Abingdon. <laughs> you know I mean? And it was just, it was just off the chain. So when we used to, I would play loads of commercial stuff for like my mates at these events. Yeah. And then I'd slowly, I'd do a bit of hip hop, then R&B, then I'd do some R&B mixes, bringing in a bit of house. 
and then I'd slowly circulate it into this and like try and show them this other world and just like commercial pop. Yeah. So for me, Jasper Street, he's all right. That whole, that whole track is just, it's incredible. It's brilliant. It's euphoric. That was my one. You touched on confidence. Um, from a young age doing what you've done to then moving into, uh, you know, a, a, a very famously difficult uh, industry um, to, to, you know, to, to reach, you know, to, 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 to have and sustain success. Like, tell me about Drive. That, well, that's, I talk about that a lot, actually. Dr drive is the only thing that has got me to where I am, I think. To have that fire to keep going when life bats you down. Because I think in my, my mum did a really good job in the sense that she t just totally believed in me constantly, you know, and I, I throughout up until like, I never, I never got the big parts. I was always like, you know, spear holder from the left. Um, and I never really got the, but I just had a belief like, no, I can do this. No, I know I am good enough. I think if I had to go and do it all again, I don't think I'd have the energy because it's knackering the constant um, rejection is, is a lot to take. Plus you're on your own the whole time. Peter O'Toole used to say, uh, the art of an actor is habitual uh, solitary study. And it is, it's about taking yourself away, reading, reading, reading what you want to prepare, getting an idea, getting your instincts together, and then taking it to the stage, taking it on set and then performing it. Um, and I think you can only do that if your drive drive is there and I think why my drive is so strong and why I've still kept going is because I was told constantly I wasn't good enough and I think I had a really good mum who was like you are so I had this blind belief that yeah no I can do this and just just kept just kept grinding away and it's the it's the only thing that I don't think you can install in a person You've either got that drive or you haven't. The only people that go out and make a success of things is because they wake up in the morning and they are hungry for that thing or whatever that is. Um, and it, it, you've, you've either got that or, or you haven't. Absolutely. Um, uh, so I was very lucky for, to have someone to go, look, follow that instinct. You know, you can, you can do this. Yeah. And that, that set that set me up really good, but it's because it's all about drive. Whether you can or you can't is irrelevant. If you yeah. just keep going, you will, because you can't fail. Absolutely. I'm gonna take you home. Favorite song for an artist from your home county, please. Um, it's gotta be Arctic Monkeys. Certain romance. Oh, do you know what? Right. It, it, in my opinion, that's the best song I've ever written. It is incredible, right? Yeah. Starts off and you feel like your head's in a washing machine, mm. like you're in a pub fight. And you're literally you like... scrapping with Paul Q's in tracky bottom, scrapping with Paul Q's. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> literally, exactly. Or you're rolling down a hill, and then all of a sudden there's a break, and there's just this beautiful guitar riff, and it's like it's it feels like the sun comes out. Mm. And you you you're lifted above the clouds or something, and it is just brilliant. I'm not. It's certain romance. Is that the one? Is that the one Stephen Graham did? No, no, that's that, that's that uh, that's um. Oh no, Stephen Graham done. Um, was it fluorescent adolescent? Uh, no, leave before no, uh, leave before the lights go out. He played the the, uh, was the, it? the pimp, didn't he? Um, uh, yeah, that's no, when, sorry, when the sun goes down. When uh, the sun goes down. Leave before the lights go out was Paddy Considine, um, uh, where uh, the the, uh, the 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 shoe comes off the top of the building and the girl's about to uh, take her own life. And oh, that's have you seen cool. that video? It's yeah, fucking. I think Shane Meadows done that. I, I might be wrong, but I Mate. think that was Shane Meadows. Uh, <laughs> He's the greatest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and just I mean. 
regarding certain romance, like that, you know, touching upon that lads in tracky bottoms, scrapping with porkies, you know, the social commentary on that record is is just bang on, and I. I I personally don't feel that they've they've touched that record since. I know that they've become rock rock stars now and they've got great great songs, but there's something about that first record, like there is with the first Oasis record, them penniless working class lads are just writing something that is just on the money. And yeah. like, do you know what I mean? It just oh, just completely right. That whole album mm. I can just listen to. And it's one of those albums where you can just start from the beginning and yeah. just you're like, this is a hit. This is a hit. Mm. This is a hit. Riot Van, just the yeah. whole attitude. It was it was a feeling of that time. They really encapsulated so well. Um, and I think that album came out. That song came out when I was like sort of fifteen, sixteen, and perfect. It did not leave. I did this uh, the CD player. It was just yeah. on and on and on and on. And yeah, totally encapsulated. Like, yeah, this is this is who I am. This is where I'm from. This is exactly what it is. I think I remember being back in going to like a pub gig in Rotherham with a friend, and they were on that night. And uh, if, before it all sort of blew up, and uh, I I can't remember. Apparently, my mate says I, I was like, oh, they're a bit shit, and it was the Arctic Monkeys. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And then it was like an album that I absolutely idolised. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Based myself on. Uh, so I, I, I always rue the day. I still don't think it was the Arctic Monkeys, but he's adamant it was. Yeah. And I, that I thought there was shit. <laughs> See, he was like, you, you're not a proper fan. You don't like live music. You just like it on an album. <laughs> <laughs> I love that sort of bollocks that you get at that age. It's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> um okay i want to ask you about um you know you know somebody that sort of grows up in you know in 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 a working class area and and finds himself in a, in an industry where uh you know as i mentioned it's a tough industry and 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 i want to know about you know finding yourself in these scenarios and places where you're getting to meet people that have been influential and, 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 you know, people that are very recognizable and like, tell me about imposter syndrome. Is that something you ever get? Yeah, daily. Yeah. I, I th and I, but I think that I, I'm 34 now and I think the thing to remember is every, everyone does. Yeah. Everyone's. So when you're at, you know, events and screenings and I was at, a screening uh, recently for Midwich Cuckoos, which is a yeah. show that got out on Sky at the moment. Uh, and David Farr, who's the uh, creator and writer, I'm, I'm in awe of his work. He did a film called The Ones Below, and it's just a wicked Hitchcockian thriller, misdirection, and just, it's, it's on the money. So when I found out that he wanted to we'd had a meeting and he wanted to offer us the part i was like oh my god this guy's like a genius and i can remember the the whole night before like this uh meeting that we had on zoom thinking okay right if he asks me this i'll try and say something this like i'll try and be uh, i just don't want to come across thick and then i had a chat with him and he was just like you're right mate how's your morning you good yeah wicked oh yeah do you want to do this part curtis i think it's really good for you you're quite edgy Think you'll find loads of fun in it. I really like your work, and I was just like, "Oh yeah, wicked! You're a normal, <laughs> you're a normal human being as well." Yeah. Uh, and then when I went to the screening, which is wicked, it was at BAFTA. There's champagne and stuff, and you see all the same humans, the same as you, and they're all wide-eyed and like, "Did you like it? Is it good? Do do it?" And I was like, "Oh wow, these people that I put on a pedestal." so highly they're all just as nervous about showing their work and feel really yeah. vulnerable about it as well so I'm, I, I, I really take a lot from that nowadays yeah. they're all just, we're all just kids like yeah. just we've got a bit more power or whatever we have the luxury of being able to do what we want to do and just to remember that everyone's waiting for that tap on the shoulder where they go what the fuck are you doing here mate get out yeah do you know yeah. what I mean you're not meant Absolutely. to be in here 
<laughs> if someone did that, I'd go, you're absolutely right. I don't know how I've got away with this, this long. I'm so sorry. Can I take a pint to the road? <laughs> So, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I try not to worry about how what sort of people think of me as much anymore. And yeah. I think being a dad now, I just don't, I haven't got the luxury of time to worry about my own. Yeah. Shit. Just kind of got to get on with it. And that stuff comes with 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 age as well, doesn't it? And, and I guess experience and and, and, yeah. and all manner of things. But I do think that I don't know if if it's a working class thing or not. I don't know, like, but you know, most people I've ever. I, I'd be surprised if somebody just went for asked them that question and just went, no, 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 I don't get imposter syndrome. I think, oh my God, they're, they're dangerous. Yeah. Like, why, why, why have they not got it? Like, that person's definitely murdered someone. Yeah, that person's got a list and I've yeah. probably just been added to it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I do know what you mean in terms of like class, like sometimes it saves someone's from you know a really affluent area there's sometimes there's like an air of confidence of or what would seem to be confidence yeah you sort of think that that they're that they should be there and quite yeah. likely they should be on that stage or whatever yeah. whereas i think maybe working class maybe by our own sort of merit tend to think oh should, should we be in here are we allowed to be at the big table yeah um but the important thing to remember is that we've all there's all space at the table and we all deserve to be there based on our merit. Uh, right. And all that that internal monologue is just is just that it's internal waffle. And Absolutely. if you, you start to show people maybe you shouldn't be there, people will start to think it. Yeah. So you you just gotta fake it till you make it, baby. All day long. All day yeah. long. <laughs> Lewis, last track, mate. I'm gonna ask you please to be a tastemaker and influencer now. Uh, and it's a song that you think many people may not know that you would like them to hear, please. Okay. Um, re- he's a really big artist, but not. I don't think. I don't know if you know him. P- PJ Morton, Grammy-winning mm-hmm. artist, soul artist. He's done. There's a live cover, uh, and it's featuring Yeba uh, of "How Deep Is Your Love," and he's probably one of the most soulful men on the planet and it is just like this this so many artists do covers now don't they because that's how i think algorithms work if they know if they do a cover Mm -hmm. then then that'll get a window into their actual work uh and this track is just uh, absolutely wicked it's a breath of fresh air on such a famous track right yeah everyone knows it but it's so refreshing and it's like truthful to that track but it takes it somewhere else and it's just one you know if i get into the kitchen alexa can you play i'll put that on because i know that'll just chill me out it's cool it feels like sunshine do you know what i mean it feels light yeah. it's soulful um and i don't know if too many people know it because see it seems to be like every time i put that on people are like what is this yeah you know it's just really chilled out that's that's a go-to one for me wonderful well people will get to check it out because we've got a spotify playlist together to accompany the podcast so people can go and listen to that and all the other tunes that we've we've spoken about today um oh my god we can get to my track and just go what on earth is this lad on (laughs) gospel house pj moore and dj jean to robbie williams angels that is just a shit sandwich it's horrendous you can't get any flow you've got to take the rough with the smooth that's where this podcast is mate yeah we oh, want right. all the embarrassing moments and we want the cool slick ones you get that's why you get to sort of sign off with something good on this like the last track is where yeah. you can uh you can yeah make up for uh the uh the embarrassment in the uh in the early years yeah. um as uh, as 2022 starting to uh come into the sort of second half of the year and and the worlds are far more open and connected uh, and, and back to a, a sense of normal that, uh, that it was a few years ago. Um, what are you looking forward to from the rest of the year, Lewis, personally, and what's going to be happening professionally? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm loving socialising again. Like I said, we're making a real effort as a family to sort of get out there a bit more. It's Glastonbury next week. Ah, wonderful. Um, so uh, the kids? We're, we're taking we're taking one. My mum's yeah. been, been taking me and my brothers. My mum's a big hippie, 
she's been taking us to Glastonbury since we were really young. Oh, so, I love that. We, and we've always we've always stayed in like the family area. And then over the years, it's like, well, I'm going to go stay at the John Peel area or whatever. Yeah. And we branch off, but we always come back. I can remember coming back, I couldn't find my tent at John Peel. So I went back to my mum's, like coming through the mesh at five in the morning. Be like, mum, I can't sleep. You got any orange juice? <laughs> um, so I'm looking forward to spending some lovely family time over the summer, uh, enjoying a bit of music, getting down to dreamland, spending some time on the beach. Uh, the, the other day, me and my wife bought rollerblades. Love uh, it. And with, but, so we've got the prams with the girls in and we just bladed across the coast. Lovely. For like a few hours, and that was just absolute heaven, man. You can do that in Margate. You wouldn't have got away with that in Doncaster, mate. No way. Yeah, me and my <laughs> tight little denim shorts rolling, blading along. <laughs> Your string vest. <laughs> yeah. Hey, boys. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they've definitely been well, quite, yeah, quite deservedly so. Um, so I'm looking, I'm looking forward to a bit more quality time like that, taking it a bit chill. The last two years has been very busy, great work wise, but it's been. Do you know I mean even on set now people have to wear masks and sure. stuff? It still feels very disconnected. So I've got a bit of time off this summer uh, and then doing a bit of press for these projects, Midwich Cuckoos. And then I've got Rosie Malloy coming out for Sky probably end of the year. Uh, Sheridan Smith starring in that. Uh, and then I'll be sort of like picking up a bit of press for that again. But I've got a bit of time off now. And I'm just going to really, really enjoy that. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Also, I've got a film that I directed last year um, here in Margate starring Carl Johnson, and that's doing the festival circuit at the moment. Uh, so I'm just really enjoying pushing those little bits and take, taking a bit of a backseat. It's lovely. Brilliant. Brilliant. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, oh, talking records you. with you, Lewis. It's been so much fun. Um, oh, if people want to keep up to speed with um, everything that you're up to, uh, where's the best place to, to stay up to uh, speed on things? Uh, probably on my socials at Lewis Reeves on Instagram and Twitter to find everything sort of through there. Wonderful. Well, I'll take you in this uh, this episode when it comes out, if that's all right with you. Mm. And yeah, mate, thanks again. It's been such a joy. Hey, man, thank you very, very much. Thanks for having me. And uh, I hope you can you can find something in that awful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to press stop. Don't go anywhere. <laughs>